Uh, I'm Pat Fraser. I'm the town meeting moderator. I am here this evening uh, to chair um, the organizational meeting of the Finance Committee. Um, as uh, people may know, John Sweeney, longtime board member and longtime uh, chairman, uh, retired after town meeting. Um, and so therefore, the board is uh, reconvening. Um, in, in light of the upcoming special town meeting, and we need to choose a, um, a new chair. Um, so I will be chairing the FinCon meeting solely for that purpose, and then I will be going home to eat my dinner. Um, so, welcome all, and I apologize for having my back to you. Um, I uh, would like to now open the meeting and receive any uh, nominations for chair. Um, Madam Moderator, I nominate Sierra Lyons as chairperson. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Um, any other uh, motions that need to be made at this time? Any other motions? Madam Moderator, I, I uh, nominate Sally Calhoun. It, it, is there a second? Second. second. All right. So there are two uh, candidates, um, Sally Calhoun uh, and um, C.R. Lyons. Um, so I guess we'll vote in, in order in which the motions were made. All those in favor of um, C.R. Lyons as the chair, kindly say aye. Should there be a just bit of discussion so, before sure, we vote? Sure, sure. I apologize, Sally. It's okay. Um, I very kindly uh, discussed with some of my committee members before our meeting, uh, and thank you very much, Paul, for the nomination. I'm about to be out for a medical leave for an extended period of time and will probably miss all of the uh, budget hearings and annual town meeting coming up in the spring. Um, and so the people asked if I would be interested in being chair. I don't, just don't feel I can do it at this point in time. So I'm delighted to have CR step step in. Okay. Should I withdraw the nomination? Yeah, if you would, Paul. Yes, I will withdraw the nomination in. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so now we have uh, one nomination for chair. Are there any other nominations? Okay. All those in favor of CR Lyons as chair, kindly say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Congratulations. I see. Yeah. Um, I think we need to select a vice chair as well, and I will leave that to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Does the board have any nominations for vice chair? I nominate Sally Calhoun as vice chair. Is there a second? Second. Are there any other nominations? All those in favor of Sally Calhoun as vice chair? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Congratulations, Sally. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Madam moderator, thank you for uh, your uh, activity here tonight and enjoy dinner. Uh, and with that, Mr. Town Man Manager, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and first apologies to the Keystone Cop routine during the nomination process. <laughs> I will assure you if everybody slides a little bit toward me, there will be room for all eight chairs uh, up at the dais. Just a little Is this way? Yep. And someday we will either buy smaller chairs or build a larger dais. We haven't quite decided which one makes more sense yet. Chairs. The finance director says smaller chairs, so we'll go with smaller chairs. Um, before we before we get into the warrant, um, I want to introduce some of the uh, some of the folks that we have uh, with us tonight. Uh, we have we have several uh, key staff members who were not with us uh, this time last year, and I'd like to introduce them as well as the other as well as the other staff members here and the members of the design team. Um, and uh, then we can then we can work into the warrant. So we have uh, Rodney Conley to my left is the new director of administration and finance. He replaced Travis Ahern, who left earlier this year. Um, sitting in the audience is Jen Breaker, our assistant town manager and communications director, uh, who also joined us earlier this year. She started right before uh, annual town meeting, but was not here for any of the hearings. So this is this is her first uh, time sitting with the FinCom for for a hearing. Uh, we have Charlie Hay from Tabay Architects. Uh, to his left is David Lane, Public Works Director, who everybody knows. And to David's left is Joe DeSantis uh, from, from PMA, uh, the owner's project manager. Hiding somewhere in the audience is Kevin Nigro, also from PMA. Um, and I see two selectmen here tonight, Diane Langley and Dan Bennett, um, who had the opportunity to review this warrant uh, last week at their warrant review meeting. With that, um, I can jump right into the warrant. The first 
So there, there are two articles uh, uh, for consideration tonight uh, for the February 4th town, special town meeting. The first is uh, a, an article uh, to accept um, supplemental Chapter 90 money uh, that was included in the, su in the supplemental FY19 budget uh, based on uh, the, the year-end closeout. The governor had recommended additional funds for roads, and the, the legislature supported that. Uh, so an additional $40 million was included in the supplemental budget, and the 181,028 uh, figure in the warrant re represents Danvers' uh, formulaic portion of that. So if, if this is approved at a special town meeting, that will allow David and his staff to access the money during the spring uh, road work. Um, otherwise, appropriations at annual town meeting aren't available until July 1st. So uh, we would recommend that this be approved. John, any questions? No, all set. Mike? Nothing. Uh, no. Nope. The other Mike, but nope. I'm getting to you. <laughs> Paul? All set. Sally? No questions, thank you. Mike? All set. Gina? No questions. Sally? I'm good. Thanks. That was really just for me to make sure I got the names right. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Is there a motion? I move the article. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, article two. Well, with the undercard out of the way, we'll move to the main event. I'm sure that the uh, vote won't be quite as quick on this one, um, but we have a couple of aspects to, uh, to sort of framing this article uh, for both the FinCom and the audience. We have a PowerPoint presentation that we will uh, work through um, for those who brought their warrant books tonight, uh, for the town meeting members in the audience. The presentation will, will sort of loosely follow what's in the warrant book. Um, we have some extra warrants at the end of the table here if anybody uh, is, in a, is in attendance that either isn't a town meeting member or left theirs at home and would like to follow along. Uh, if anybody's watching at home, they can find the warrant on the town website. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is um, work through most of the presentation. We'll have uh, the architect and the, o and the OPM talk a little bit about some of the project and processes that got us to this point. Um, and, then, and then with your permission, I would like to finish walking through the warrant uh, and then we can, and then the, the conversation and questions can start at that point. We've numbered the slides, so if, if folks have questions that are related to a specific aspect of the presentation, um, I would suggest noting the slide number and we can, we can toggle back and forth. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So without further ado, I'll, I'll dive into the presentation. So the, the, the first slide here will be uh, quite familiar to some and less familiar to others, but uh, this provides sort of a very brief sort of overview of the process that got us uh, to this point. Um, the Smith School was built in 1973. Uh, it hasn't had any major renovations uh, in the 45 years that it's been around. Um, really in 2011, uh, the, some, of the, some of the issues with the building became uh, acute in terms of uh, maintenance and, and things that David and his staff uh, were seeing. So it's a concrete and steel building. Um, some of the walls have, have corroded out and had to been patched and repaired by the Public Works Department. Uh, the roof on the school is currently the second roof, and it's, it's reached the end of its life, and a lot of the building mechanicals are also in need of upgrade or repair. So um, that, that is in addition to the fact that uh, I think everybody understands that the open concept classroom that this school was designed around in the 1970s has sort of uh, not, not stayed current, that the 21st century learning has moved beyond that model. So the, the town, as the high school project was, was being uh, constructed and financed, uh, began applying right away uh, to see if the MSBA would partner with the town on this project, as they have in projects past. Uh, the town first applied to partner with the MSBA in 2013. Uh, on the fourth application, the project was accepted. Uh, a quick note, not on the slide, but in the warrant, uh, funding that the MSBA can use to support local projects comes from a portion of the sales tax. Um, annually, there are far more requests than there are uh, available funds, so it is a competitive process. Um, depending on, you know, the, the larger the school approved, for example, the fewer projects that year that, that can get included. So on the town's fourth attempt, uh, the project was accepted into the process. In May 2016, our annual town meeting appropriated the design money to start this process, uh, which, which has brought us to this point. And a school building committee uh, was immediately formed uh, with representatives from the neighborhood, uh, FinCom, school committee, board of selectmen, uh, several members of staff, um, and, and non-member residents as well, non-neighbor residents as well. 
And uh, a note here that we'll get into a little deeper in a few slides. <coughs> the initial proposal from the building committee was to the MSBA to replace the school with a similarly sized school. Um, but based on some projections, uh, required, it's required on all MSBA projects that you undergo uh, student enrollment projections uh, through UMass. And based on those projections, the, M the MSBA came back and recommended that the town reconsider that, that plan. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the school building committee was also very involved with uh, the hiring of uh, PMA, POPM on the project, uh, as well as TAFA, um, which <coughs> is the design team uh, on the project. This just quickly over, quick overview of the, the outreach that's taken place since, since the, uh, the annual town meeting. Uh, the school building committee has uh, hosted or planned you know, 20 projects, uh, project related meetings, all open to the public. <coughs> Uh, they, they held three community forums. We had a presentation at the town open house for folks who were coming through town hall, several presentations before the, the select board. And one of the important notes, I think, um, some of the concerns that we, that we knew about uh, going into the project and, and that emerged during the, the planning and, and uh, design feasibility portion of the project um, really aligned with the, you know, the committee concerns, the staff concerns, and the neighbor concerns all sort of aligned. We wanted to, the goal to improve traffic flow in and onto and off of the school site. Um, there was uh, an inadequate amount of parking on the, on the site currently, and so one of the goals was to, to expand the parking on site to pull <coughs> on-street parking out of the neighborhoods. Um, and really with a, what is a challenging site because of wetlands on three sides and some grade changes to try to optimize um, you know, the space available and preserve the soccer field, which gets a lot of use. So after tonight, um, we, the, the special town meeting, of course, is scheduled for February 4th, and we have a Saturday uh, workshop uh, similar to the one that we held for the zoning updates last year that's scheduled for Saturday the 26th from 9 to noon in this room. Light refreshments will be served. One of the questions um, that, that came up early in this process from both the committee and, you know, and, and, and uh, stakeholders who've been following the project you know, did we did we consider just renovating the existing school or doing an addition on the existing school? And that's actually a requirement uh, of the MSBA. You have to look at each of these three options. A fourth fourth requirement is that uh, the town look at whether there are other available sites beyond beside the the current school site. Um, we didn't have any sites that would that would accommodate a school. Uh, the renovation option, as noted there, would have been between 20 and 25 million dollars based on very preliminary analysis from the architect, um, but it, it would do nothing to accommodate uh, the growth and it would have required displacing uh, the student body during the project. Uh, similarly, the addition renovation project, um, a lot of the structural issues with the existing school would have, would have remained. Um, it, it ended up being the most costly option of the three once you tied in the new space and, and renovated the old space. And so the, the school building committee and uh, the MSBA uh, landed on uh, the new construction option is the most cost-effective cost in terms of meeting the, the needs now and in the future, and that's the project that uh, will be discussed for the remainder of the presentation. A another question, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the increase in the, in the school size. Uh, when, we, when we first met with the MSBA in Boston, we had proposed to replace, again, the existing school with a similarly sized school. Uh, they, they did an analysis, they look at um, birth rates, they look at actual births in the preceding years, they look at the fertility rates within the community, um, um, and, and a host of other factors, and they build out what they think your student population will look like for the 10 years following um, you know, the, the SOI stage. And they looked at our demographics, they looked at the data I just referenced, and they said, that their projections show something like a 17% increase in the next 10 years for K through five. Um, the, the committee was quite skeptical. Um, they pointed out that most of those kids were already born and a light bulb went off for me because two of them live in my house, <laughs> with a five-year-old and a two-year-old who aren't in the school system yet but are coming. Um, and then they also commented that when, they, when a similar study was done in 2005, they projected to within a percent of our actual student population in 2015. So, Historically, they've been very good at, at projecting this, and based on that strong recommendation, um, the, the school that is proposed um, is almost double in size, the one that's there now, and the, the analysis at the bottom of the screen indicates how the MSBA came up with their recommendation for a school <coughs> that 
eventually had, could hold a total of 465 students. That wouldn't be in 2021 when the school opens because of those students, again, um, some of them are still two and three years old, but this will allow for the gradual increase in that to accommodate uh, the growth uh, that, that is coming. And I know that Dr. Dane and the school committee are looking currently at, uh, in terms of districting and, and, and flexible zoning to make sure that that growth is accommodated evenly across the elementary schools. Um, and there's information on the website as well related to uh, the analysis that was done for, for the student population growth. Um, you can't read anything on the screen here, um, but more than anything else, it shows this is a, you know, building a school is not a six-month process. Um, as noted, some of the issues with the school emerged in 2011. We started applying to participate with the MSBA in 2013. As you can see, um, we're, we're working toward uh, the 2020 to 22 phase, and if town meeting does support the project, on February 4th, we would potentially have some preliminary construction started before the end of 2019 uh, with the goal of having the school open uh, for the 2021-22 school year. And this is a, just a bit of a zoom in on um, a portion of that timeline. You can see here the key milestones uh, that the school building committee um, has met in terms of satisfying MSBA requirements. Um, the MSBA board voted to, to accept the project and the budget uh, in, in December, which is important because that's what locks in their commitment to fund their, their portion of the project. Um, and, and looking forward, the next milestone in, in terms of local approvals would be the, the town meeting vote on February 4th. And uh, not in bold, but at the bottom shows a very rough sketch of uh, what the timeline would look like moving forward from that point. So with that, I'll send the clicker down to Charlie <laughs> to show um, some of the design features and some of the aspects of the site on the project. And then I think uh, Joe will talk a little bit about uh, project budget and some of the um, aspects in terms of how this project is being managed. And then um, I think the clicker will get uh, lobbed back down to this end and I can finish the, my aspect of the presentation. Uh, good evening, Charlie Hay from Tepe Architects. Thank you. Um, I will go fairly quickly through this presentation. Some people in the room have seen it. Some of you probably have not. Uh, please ask questions if you have them. Um, the proposed plan uh, is on your right, and the existing conditions plan is on your left. Um, and one of the concerns um, with uh, going forward has always been, well, we have constraints in terms of parking on site, we have traffic issues on site. So what this shows you is we have a significant increase in, in parking proposed on the right hand uh, drawing, including a designated uh, faculty lot uh, of 75 parking spaces. But generally we're increasing parking by about three times and we're only doubling the population of the school. So this should make a significant uh, uh, improvement in terms of the condition of the site now. Um, another issue that has come up, and these are kind of frequently asked questions, which is why we developed these slides to talk about them. Another frequent concern has been around service uh, and location of service. We have developed in the right-hand slide, you can see a uh, service around the back of the building, so it is not does not impact at all on outside areas that students are going to be in during the day, play areas, uh, outdoor educational areas. Currently with the school, as you know, um, the, the hardscape play area is precisely where the dumpster is and precisely where the service um, entrance is. So you have a, com a, a, a not good from a planning point of view combination. Um, you would prefer to see those separated. Uh, in terms of building design, forgive me, did I skip a slide or two? Okay, so let's go back. There's the proposed site. Um, and you can see uh, that blue box there is sort of where the play area is. Uh, you can see the existing soccer field is remaining. Um, and it will not be in use during construction. It will be closed for two years. However, it will be uh, available after the project is complete. Uh, you can see the drive coming in. Uh, as I mentioned, the parking, <coughs> the new parking, but the other feature of this that uh, is important 
is the kind of problems there now with uh, car queues and pick up and drop off uh, with buses and cars. And if you look at the left hand slot, the left hand image, you can see that the, that those red dotted that red dotted line is essentially cars coming in, and you can see what they're doing. They're sort of coming up to the back of those yellow uh, boxes, which are buses. And so we have fundamentally do not have enough que queuing uh, on site to accommodate cars. The new plan separates car traffic from bus traffic, which means that you can have a live car queue that's always moving. You never have an issue with cars having to stop behind flashing lights of a bus. Uh, and it also, obviously, because the building is being moved to the left, which is the west, uh, there's considerably more on-site queuing for cars uh, uh, on-site. And in addition, there is now a dedicated loop for buses that can accommodate up to six um, buses standing. So it should be, again, a considerable, uh, significant improvement in terms of the site conditions uh, there. I've talked about... Um, Parking, I've talked about the service area. In terms of the building, this is an image that's sort of sh as if the, build the roof of the building had been chopped off. Uh, but you can see where the entrance is on the left. Is this, is, is this where he does? On the left here, um, that's the main entrance coming into this lobby. So that's where students will be entering. That's where uh, visitors will be entering. And this whole zone in the front uh, is really the public part of the school. So that's going to have the gym in it. It has a ca cafeteria in it. And in fact, the cafeteria and the gym share a platform for performances, uh, which was one of the requests of the school. Administration is up front, uh, so we have a controlled uh, uh, entrance. And this whole zone becomes really a public building in a way. And you can close off the right-hand side, which is the uh, uh, academic area, uh, if you wish, in order to have evening use. Uh, weekend use. So it zones very nicely as a building that is not only a school but a really effective community building. The, uh, the classroom in arts and music is also off the lobby for performances and um, public functions. The, the rest of the building is organized. There are two kind of um, academies. One is kindergarten on the first floor. One is fifth grade on the second floor. Those are really kind of different from the middle grades in an elementary school, their transition years, kindergarten, you're transitioning into school, uh, fifth grade, you're transitioning out of elementary school and into middle school. So they are kind of set up somewhat differently. Uh, grades one, two, three, and four are arrayed uh, in classrooms around the, the uh, rest of the building. And it is, uh, it is a two-story classroom wing. So it has K, one, and two on the first floor, and three, four, and five on the second floor. There is a stair in the center and an elevator in the center. That's a split level building, which means students are only going down or up half a level to get to their classroom wings, which is a nice feature. And that takes advantage of the site, which is sloping off to the back, as you know. Th that's a floor plan that shows you uh, in one dimension what you just saw in two dimensions. And that's the, uh, the, the lower level. Um, and then that is the upper level with the fifth grade academy there and uh, three and four there. Uh, we have some views that have been developed uh, that give you a little bit of a sense of what the project may look like ultimately. Uh, it is obviously continues to be developed um, as we continue to work on it. Um, this shows uh, a lobby. This shows entering a lobby here and coming this way and turning around and looking back from where you came from. There's the entrance to the cafeteria. The entrance to the gym is right here. Art and music are sitting right here. Music can spill out into this space, so you could have a, a, a small performance where parents came and watched. Um, you could have an art show and have you know display out in here. Uh, so it becomes a um, a, a, a student-driven space, but also a public space. Uh, this is turning back again and looking back towards the classroom wing, and you can see here you're going up a half a flight of stairs or down a half a flight of stairs. And at the head of the classroom wing are two big spaces which uh, will be um, shared by every student. One is a library media center on the lower level, and the other is a STEM 
steam space which is a kind of a project room on the upper level and those also could be used by the public while the rest of the building is is closed off so there are doors there that could close off and you could still use these again com uh, continuing education community education uh, evening meetings all those kind of things so the building is set up to accommodate a wide variety of uses um, Another interesting feature of the project is outside of the classrooms are extra wide corridors that really create uh, collaboration zones and are called, we're calling extended learning zones. And those um, allow for students to move out into those areas out of sight of their traditional, the four walls of their classroom for uh, special projects, for small group learning, for one-on-one -on -one, uh, instruction. Um, and for working individually. And uh, that gives a whole other dynamic to, um, to, the, to how the school can uh, accommodate different modes of learning. Um, this is an, a conceptual exterior view. It has changed some since, that, since this was done, but it shows an entrance here with the lobby behind it and a, a cafeteria in front and a nice front plaza, welcoming front plaza. Uh, and you can see the classroom wing down in the back with the, with the, with the land falling off there, uh, and then the, the uh, drive leaving the site. Um, that is kind of the conceptual sort of planning stage we're in now. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it to Joe DeSantis to talk about costs. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Hi, everyone. Uh, Joe DeSantis with PMA Consultants, Owners Project Manager. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. Um, before I start on the project budget, I'd like to briefly touch on the role of an OPM. So we're brought on very early in the, um, as soon as you're through the eligibility phase with MSBA, and we immediately serve as your liaison for the town of Danvers with the MSBA. Um, we manage the budget, the schedule, we do monthly reports, um, reimbursement requests, we oversee the design, um, we attend project meetings and make sure that what the owner is talking about in the meetings is getting incorporated into the design, all while staying on budget. Um, and then for construction, we're there from the first shovel hitting the ground to the last punch list item closing. So our project budget summary is shown here, um, kind of a high level summary. Um, but first, I'd like to kind of speak on the MSBA process a bit. So it's an eight part grant program that the MSBA does with multiple submittals and review processes as part of each part. Um, we've done three submittals to date and each contain two independent third party construction cost estimates. The latest submittal was the schematic design um, and that cost estimate from the estimators, um, the designer's cost estimate of record is really important because that becomes the town basis of the funding agreement with the MSBA. So you'll see here the grand total in yellow. Which one is it? Uh, it's a green one. Yeah, it took me a while to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, $52 million. Um, so last month we went in front of the MSBA's board of directors and we had a unanimous vote to approve the project scope and budget, which is great. We're about a year away from having 100% full bidding documents prepared. So at this point in our budget, we contain high numbers for design, um, design contingency, 10 to 12%, as well as cost escalation, things getting more important, uh, more expensive over time. So you'll see down there, there's about $7.6 million at this point in contingency dollars, some of which will make its way back up into the trades. So, the MSBA grant program provides reimbursement for a percentage of eligible costs. People who have heard this presentation know I repeat those words a lot. Um, there's also cost caps to consider. So the first one that comes to mind for me is the MSBA will only participate in up to $2,400 per student for FF&E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and technology. Um, similarly, there's categorically ineligible costs such as legal fees and moving costs. So each town in the MSBA grant program has a unique reimbursement rate. If you look in the top right corner, the table here from kind of summarizing how we got to ours. Um, so we're at a reimbursement rate of 55.46% of eligible project costs. Um, and that includes 4.88 incentive points. 
Two of those are for energy efficiency, um, committing to having a green building, uh, mass chip certified for high performing systems. Uh, the Town of Danvers earned a great 1.88 out of the possible two um, incentive points for great maintenance practices. Basically during the eligibility period, the town submits uh, maintenance records to the MSBA, and this is the MSBA's way of acknowledging that they're putting their money into a good town that will take care of it. Um, and then we were actually grandfathered into that last 1% there for the CM and risk incentive point um, based on where we were in the MSBA project pipeline. They no longer offer this, but we were just able to get in with it. I'll touch on CMR in a little bit. Um, so someone who may not be as familiar with the grant process of the MSBA would say we have a $52 million total project cost, 55.46% reimbursement rate, our grant should then be, multiply the two together, and you get the $28.84 million. <coughs> but unfortunately, due to the cost caps and categorically ineligible costs that I mentioned before, that's not the case. So the grant is actually reduced by over $8 million due to some of those cost caps. And you'll see that the effective maximum MSBA grant is a little shy of $20.5 million, leaving the town of Danvers with a share of $31.5 million. I'd like to point out that this assumes that every single contingency dollar is fully spent. You have to spend it to get it back, reimbursed on a percentage basis. So if you look up here, Steve and Jen did a nice job putting this table together. I can't steal the credit for it. Um, they put together all the deductions from that ideal 28.8 to the actual 20.5. And the biggest contributor is a $6.25 million deduction for the MSBA's $333 cost per square foot cap. I'd like to point your attention to the table in the bottom right corner. Um, so it shows by year from 2010 to now, uh, to 2018 I should say actually, the MSBA's cap are currently at 333 per square foot. Um, the average MSBA cost per square foot of their projects and their pipeline, and then the difference. Back in 2010, around the time of the high school project in town here, that was a zero difference. Fast forward to now, MSBA reimbursement is slightly behind in terms of where these projects are coming in at. Our cost is currently um, forecasted at a little over $508 per square foot. Um, I'd also like to just mention that cost per square foot, while it's a good indicator of some of the design elements, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, the easiest way to kind of put that into a picture for you is if we had the same school, we're at 83,000 square feet now, if we were to double that size, that cost per square foot would most likely go down due to economies of scale. So just keep that in mind, um, the site costs. All these projects are different from one another. And Joe, before you jump to the next slide, I'd like to point out something about that that I think we'll, town meeting members will remember from the high school project. This is a question that came up uh, at our forum at the middle school because uh, the, the amount of ineligible cost in this project is higher as a percent than it was on the high school. Um, whereas the, the amount of ineligible de, uh, space designed into this project is much less than the high school. So town meeting members will remember that on that project, we designed the administrative wing into that project knowing that the MSBA would not reimburse us for it. But because at the time of that project, the reimbursement per square foot was almost equal to the average cost to build a school, we didn't see something like we see here, which is $6.2 million deemed ineligible for no other reason than the reimbursement cap has not kept pace with the market. So I don't think anybody in the room would want to go through another recession to see those averages come back in line with each other. But one of the, um, this, is, this is something we're facing on this project, is that in the past, eight years, the average cost to build a school has nearly doubled. But because the MSBA's funding is tied to the sales tax, and the higher that cap, the fewer projects they can fund, it's created a give and take. So we would love to see the number higher, and I think we, we, we try to keep in context that we're still getting a 20 plus million dollar grant from the state to build the school. Um, but in an 83,000 square foot school, and that's noted in the warrant, the only space in that school that the MSBA deemed ineligible was one teacher planning room, or 188 square feet. So everything that was designed into the project was reimbursable, but the, the hard cap on the reimbursement um, is what drove down the effective grant. Thank you, Steve. I was going to point that out as well. The 188 Sorry, square feet and uh, 
acknowledgement of the town and the input that we've had and the careful consideration of everyone from the school department, everyone in town hall to keep the cost caps in mind. No one's asking for the Lamborghini. We're all going for the Chevy. Um, and it's a great school design currently that we have. Every, all the need to haves and all the want to haves are in the budget as we speak. Um, so kind of along the same lines, I mentioned I'd like to touch on the utilization of the CMR project delivery method. It's the construction manager at risk, chapter 149A, Mass General Law. Um, as opposed to the traditional design bid built where the architect brings the bid documents to 100% bidding level, you put the um, bids out on the street, you receive price, and you kind of end up married to the lowest responsible bidder, a bit of a forced marriage at the time of construction. What we were actually able to do was last month bring on W.T. Rich, um, eight firms applied for this project. We interviewed four of them. They did price proposals and non-price proposals, and it was a qualification-based process. And we ended up with the number one team we wanted, and they came in at a good price as well. So the great part about that is we have them for pre-construction services for a number of months. So they're performing design reviews at every MSBA submittal, save money and save time in the long run. They're looking at our schedule. They're looking at logistics. They're looking at how to put the trailer, the lay down areas, and it's about saving money, saving time, and increased safety, which is obviously, goes without saying, but I'd be remiss not to say, it's important on an occupied elementary school site. Um, so the CMR will perform four construction cost estimates before we have 100% bidding documents. So really, it keeps the design in line, and they will, if the budget starts to go up, what they're seeing is um, they'll provide recommendations, change this to that, and save money. Um, and not to slight any construction cost estimators in the room, if there are any, or watching on TV, but it means more when the company who's actually building the school provides you with the cost estimate. There's an onus on them to <coughs> deliver that budget, which is really important. Um, and then two other quick points, I'm sorry Steve, I'm going on. Um, it allows for the use of early packages, so we're able to put out a early landscape demolition package prior to having 100% bid documents and get some site clearing, and it allows us to get work done prior to the winter. Um, and then you get more bids from subs who have had a good experience working with WT Rich. More bids, more competitive, better prices is a great um, benefit for the town of Danvers. So. Thank you, Steve. I'll pass this uh, back down. We've already touched on uh, most of these, so I won't, I won't repeat anything here. This just shows the timeline through uh, the end of the project if approval happens. And um, I'd like to touch on a couple of items that are in the warrant but not part of the presentation. Um, and that has to do with uh, the, the financing options for the project and the potential uh, tax impact for the project, uh, which are um, issues that are, I know, of great concern to, mem to folks in the room. Um, the team to my left uh, needs to design the school and navigate the MSBA process. Uh, and the local officials have to determine um, whether A, to approve the project, and B, what the most appropriate financing plan for the project is. So if I could have just a couple of minutes. Um, this starts really on page four in the warrant. Um, as, as Joe and Charlie mentioned, uh, the $52 million project uh, uh, budget right now has been through seven uh, cost estimators, meaning um, everybody looks at the, the quantities and square footage and, um, and site layout and comes up with their estimate, um, and then they have to reconcile those numbers together. And as was indicated, uh, within that $52 million is currently $7.5 million in contingency um, because uh, we can deliver a project for less than the uh, authorized amount, um, but to be to be wrong requires going back and asking for additional funds, and so nobody wants to do that. Uh, the MSBA won't participate in that. Um, the, the design team doesn't want to be a part of a project like that. So there's a, there's a high level of confidence in the $52 million today because of those escalation contingencies uh, that, are, that are held at this point, which will either, as Joe mentioned, be absorbed into the project um, or released back to uh, uh, ultimately a bond uh, rescission at the end of the project. It means we have to borrow less money if we don't use that contingency. So we received, uh, as was indicated, by November we had a, a pretty solid uh, budget estimate. Um, the MSB, MSBA approved that. 
uh, in December. On December 4th, we were able to present to the Board of Selectmen some different uh, funding models for that project. We know that the maximum uh, that the town will be asked to pay on this project is $31.5 million. So we were able to use that figure with our financial advisors to look at um, what the debt structures might look like uh, for that over the next 10, not 10, 20, 25, 30 years. So the, um, the, the, the financial summit uh, that was put on on December 4th uh, and presented to the school committee, the board of selectmen, the planning board, the finance committee, and the library trustees looked at really the two options that the town has. Um, we are, we're, we're pretty far along in the FY20 budget process. Uh, we started in December uh, holding uh, departmental meetings. We had our first meetings with the schools and the library uh, last week to look at the big picture for the budget. And the FY20 budget uh, assumes that the Smith School is financed the same way the high school was, which is a 30-year level debt financing. Um, that's explained in fairly good detail in the warrant, and there's a table in the back of the warrant that would show uh, the cost over 30 years to finance that project. Um, so the, we knew five years ago uh, that, um, or I certainly knew when I was hired uh, almost five years ago that the town wanted to see uh, if there was a path forward to build the Smith School without a debt exclusion, and there is. And that's what the FY20 budget is built upon. Um, so the, the, the town meeting vote on February 4th, if, if the school were to pass, uh, would include funding necessary to finance this project over 30 years. Um, the, the warrant describes what that means. Uh, the, most, uh, the most telling difference between that model and the other option, which would be a 20-year financing option, um, is an additional $14 million in interest payments that would have to be paid uh, over those 30 years. Uh, so, so as noted in this warrant, the other option that the town could consider, and which the Board of Selectmen started to discuss in December and continued to discuss in, in January and will continue to discuss as well at their meeting next Tuesday, is a 20-year financing option, which would require a debt exclusion, uh, which it would be a vote that would go to the, the, the voters. It, it's, it's confusing, but it, uh, under state law, debt exclusions are, are referendum ballot questions for voters and not town meetings. So the, the and this, but this was a fairly confusing point at the, at the selections meeting, so I thought it was worth spending a couple of minutes tonight sort of describing <coughs> the differences. Um, the 20-year the, the financing option uh, over the life of the, of the bond would be roughly $46 million in total debt payments, and it would be paid off after 20 years as opposed to 30 years. Um, there's no right or wrong way to finance the project. We do have a path forward to do the project within our current levy. Um, as was also noted at the financial summit, we have a lot of costs in our budget that are escalating much faster than Prop 2.5 allows. So we have, we have health care, we have retirement costs, we have Essex Tech assessments. Um, those are, those are increasing at, at a rapid rate. So the, 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 the way that we fund this school within the levy means probably saying no to um, Sandy Beach improvements or LaBelle's Grove improvements for a period of time because it's going to put a lot of pressure on the operating budget. But that was the, that was the mission. Um, and, and again, there's a path forward under that scenario. So the, the, the vote on the fourth would be independent of any decision related to a debt exclusion. Um, and, and, they, and that was a point that town meeting members had a lot of questions about it at the selections meeting, and I'm sure we'll have additional questions about tonight. Um, and, and we're prepared to, to try to help. You know, our, our role in this is to make sure everybody is informed and understands what the options are. Um, but that was, I think, at the last meeting, um, we, 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 we didn't have an opportunity to kind of lay that portion of it out, and I wanted to take a couple of minutes tonight to do that. And then when we look um, as well in the warrant book, um, in terms of the tax impact, the, the, the difference between the two financing options is roughly $22 per year for the, for the 22 years where they, where they overlap. Um, the real difference occurs in those last 10 years. And so, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's presented here and there's a table. The 30-year the, the, the funding model would save taxpayers an average of $22 per year during the first 20 years but ultimately would cost the average taxpayer an additional $1,100 during those last 10 years. So the trade-off, just to oversimplify it, is we can save money in the near term, um, but it costs more money in the long term. And there is no right or wrong answer, but I just I, I wanted to clarify that tonight. So I think with that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman, and we would be happy to answer any questions that you have about the presentation or any other aspect of my remarks. Thank you. Mike, you're up. Oh, thank you. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, I think uh, somewhere along the line, probably a month ago, there was a mention of a 25-year plan. Do you have any facts or figures on that? And if that could be uh, included under the, the budget, the normal budget, and no dirty words like debt exclusion. So I would, I would um, the short answer is yes, we have that. The, it's not in this document because, again, the, the options that the board looked at were really kind of the two extremes. It, it's not certain at a 25-year, so the give would be um, the, the average impact would go up slightly from the 30-year. The average savings would come down slightly from the 20-year. Um, it's suspect whether uh, the current, so we're, we're about $45,000 from our levy limit in the current year's budget. Yeah. And if you look at page four of the warrant book, you'll get sort of a snapshot of what the ebb and flow within the school stabilization fund has been over time. Right. You can see that in, in FY 2009, uh, the, the fund was at a peak of almost $7 million in anticipation of the high school project. Uh, that fund was drawn down to a low of $3.6 million in FY16, and in the last three years, we've built it back up to $5.8 million. When you look at the next page, uh, you'll see that based on current trends, in order to do the 30-year model without a debt exclusion would require a total of $8.3 million in stabilization funds, meaning between today and FY26, we still need to find $2.5 million in free cash that is appropriated by town meeting each year to offset those peak debt years. So the short answer, Mike, is it's, it's unlikely or unclear whether the 25-year funding model would allow us to do it without a debt exclusion. Um, and we could find out two years from now that it's not the case, and I think that's a risky proposition. Um, we, we certainly know, again, when you look at page five, the projections to do the 20-year financing without a debt exclusion uh, re requires almost $13 million in, in stabilization funds, and there's no way we'd be able to achieve that. So, because you want to go, like, you try to figure on 6% debt of the town. Did you try to that's been shoot a, that's that been a marker. Yeah, that's been a... So you don't think that 25 after a year or two would, because uh, I think a lot of people are scared about, you know, this $14 million difference. Uh, I, but if, if you go over all of the figures you just said, $1,100 over 10 years, everybody, that's only a over 100 bucks a year for 10 years. So I, don't, I think they could probably live with that. Uh, what is going to be the, do you have, what the interest rate in the bond figures is going to be? And is that going to be... Uh, better later on than it is right now? That's, um, th this is the part of the presentation where you want to say no, past performance is no indicator for future, past, I get that wrong every time. <laughs> we know that um, what we have here from, from First Southwest is what we think is a conservative, sorry, Hilltop Securities because our financial advisors changed the names last year. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly, we think, conservative assumption in terms of interest rates, but we also know interest rates are rising. Um, what the final interest rate ends up being, and I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Rodney in a second, because um, he, he knows, I think we're at four and four and a half percent, four percent on the 20 year model in this scenario, four and a half percent in the 30 year model. Those numbers will, n will probably deviate slightly in the, in the final analysis, but what the key is is the spread, and, and what Hilltop can tell us is the, the delta between a 20 and 30 year issuance is roughly a half a point. So whether it's three and three quarters, and four and a quarter, or four and four and a half, you may see some fluctuation, but that's, it's the spread between the two that drives the part of the difference there. Okay. Like that's correct. correct. Yeah. And uh, when you, are you gonna revise this, uh, eventually the, uh, the Warren article to include the exact way we're gonna fund this? So that we have, this, this warrant explanation, explanation never changes. What, it, what, get, what will end up being a provided to town meeting after the uh, finance committee uh, deliberates and votes is the, is the specific article language required by the MSBA and council. Right. So we yeah, have that. Like final draft. Source of, uh, free, right. free cash or, uh, or whatever else. It generally says by borrowing or any other borrowing means. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, uh,
Okay, I, I got I got a little reference from the man of uh, down the end there about uh, well, between a Chevy and a high-priced car, but uh, if the, the state is giving you like three hundred thirty-three dollars per square foot and you're up to five oh nine, so I don't think that's exactly a, a, a small a small increase. Is um, there something else that could drive that five oh nine down a little bit that we don't really need? Or? Mike, before I let Joe answer that question, I want to refer you to the bottom of page three in the warrant. And uh, the information presented here is off of the MSBA website. So we, we, the, the, when you look at the projects that are currently uh, underway with the MSBA, whether they're in construction or final design, mm -hmm. um, the average square foot cost is between $490 and $540 a square foot. And that's, that's the market in Massachusetts. That, so that would be any, any MSBA school currently in design in Massachusetts, that's the range we're looking at on a square foot basis. At the top of the following page, you'll see the, the Smith School is at 509 is the average. You take the $42 million construction cost and the 83,000 square feet, and that's where you end up. So um, I, what I would say is if, if that number were 610 or 650, I think red flags would go off for a lot of us in terms of what's, what's in this project that shouldn't be. But this, this square foot cost is, is well within the range of what is being built right now in the state. So you consider the 509 is reasonable? I think what's unreasonable is the is the 333 cap because the um, and I would well, we I don't need to go. probably bare bones I imagine. Well, the, but the the cap just to clarify, the the MSBA says we will we will reimburse 55 in our case 55.46 of eligible costs. That's the overarching reimbursement. But within the project, they say we will only reimburse up to 333 dollars a square foot. Can be a little misleading because the assumption is that we should be building schools for $333 a square foot. The reality is, in 2010, that cap was was equal to the average cost to build a school. So construction costs at that time, coming out of the recession, were equal to what the state was willing to partner on. Fast forward, and the the reimbursement cap has increased by roughly $60, but the cost to build schools has nearly doubled from $275 to somewhere between $5 and $490 and, and 540. So it's and I guess the big thing, Mike, we're not done with the 509. We have some good professional cost estimates that show this what, what's you know a true Danvers package has been designed at 509. However, Joe's firm, us, Charlie's firm has a whole list of the value engineering things. The design isn't done yet. We're get, we need to go take a hard look at the 509 and try to shave everything off that that we can. However, like Mr. Bartha said, we just can't go forward with any number less than 509 right now. It wouldn't be prudent. But we're going to work hard to get it lower than that. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, and I just would follow up on the 333. The MSBA would acknowledge the 333 is not based on marketplace data. It's simply a line in the sand that they've set for their own internal budgeting for what they'll contribute. So it's not really in any way linked to any market data around construction <coughs> costs. Uh, one of the one, there's a, a lady that brought up uh, at the uh, selectmen's meeting a problem with the uh, regarding where the loading dock was located. Has that been addressed or anything? So Charlie's firm has taken a hard look at that loading dock, and we're limited by where it can go and how it can fit. We've had it on both sides of the school. We've tried to move the school around. Right now, we have the loading dock tucked around behind screening, behind a wall, behind plantings, and there's room to get off there. We've shortened up the road to it as much as possible. So we believe we're protecting the loading area from, from the neighborhood. We've actually decreased the amount of space with the cost of it by not having a whole traditional loading ramp. We actually have trucks that come in with power tailgates, and it's the preferred option from staff. So we've actually been able to simplify the loading area. And we think we've done the best we can. We can't go any further to the west because we're into the wetlands. We're right up against it. And, um, but we think we've done a good job screening it from the street. And there'll be a time constraint on them who is the one that they can come in? It, we can work with the school on all that, like we have now. Okay. An, an, another concern that was expressed at that meeting was around whether the trucks could actually get back in there. And right. we have done detailed uh, turning radius analysis for all sorts of different vehicles, semi-trailers, the, f the largest Danvers ladder truck, uh, dun uh, dun um, excuse me, uh, garbage trucks, uh, and uh, there is no issue in terms of the design of the roadway relative to a, a, a vehicle going into that area. 
Okay, uh, it's just too bad that all the constraints that are put on by the state because what's going to happen is basically instead of 56 point or whatever percent it was, it's good, they're only going to be picking up about 40 percent of the bill. So that's, uh, I know that's not our fault. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Sally Calhoun. Thank you. <clears throat> I should know the answer to this, but I know at the end of the of the language we see tonight that the question is still before the selectmen as to which which option to recommend, I guess. Is that is that accurate for me to assume that the selectmen will recommend one, either the 20 year or the 30 year when we meet for our special town meeting? I think so the, the board asked to have the the um, financing uh, question put on their agenda for next Tuesday because they'd like they wanted to have some additional time to speak with stakeholders and think about this question for themselves. I, I think what makes what makes our project particularly confusing is that in in most places that consider debt exclusions, that is the only way they can pay for a project like this. Danvers, you know, added to the list of things that makes Danvers unique, but the but the five really twenty years of planning to be able to do schools like this has positioned the town to pay for the school without a debt exclusion. The, the question before the board really isn't um, uh, do we need to do the exclusion in order to pay for the project, it's we have a plan to pay for the project, but should we be looking at other financing options that could save the town money in the long term? And I think a lot of the town meeting members said at their meeting last week, we'd be more comfortable knowing going into town meeting where the board is leaning on that question. Um, but under state law, they're, they're completely separate questions. It would be illegal to put the question before town meeting if there weren't a way to pay for the project. We would be in violation of state law. So the, the fact that the warrant is before you tonight, we have a funding plan within existing resources to build the school without a debt exclusion. The question the board is asking itself is, should we be considering putting this question before the voters and letting them determine whether the, the trade-off of, of higher taxes in the early years is worth the savings in the later years? The only requirement is that if a debt exclusion is going to be considered, that vote has to occur prior to the issuance of the debt. So the town meeting date is irrelevant. What, what's relevant is if that question is going to be asked and answered, it has to happen prior to the issuance of debt. So something else that's a little different on our project, on the high school project, typically on a, high on a, on a building project, you'll issue bond anticipation notes, you'll build the project, and then you'll issue your long-term debt. Because of what Hilltop is seeing in the bond market right now, they're encouraging all of their clients to the extent that they can to be issuing their long-term debt this spring at a comfortable level. So we won't, we, we won't be able to issue our full debt because we don't know what the final bill will be for the project. But we know with certainty that if we have a $52 million project, $52 million project today with a $31 million local max, <clears throat> odds are we're going to spend 20 to 25 million of that. We may not need to spend the full 30. But they're saying, they're strongly recommending that we issue as much of that as we can this spring, which changes the time frame on a question like a debt exclusion, because we now have to decide if, if that's something we're going to pursue. Uh, it has to be a springtime decision so that we can issue the debt this spring and not wait another year and face higher interest rates. So it's. So that it kind of brings me to the next part of my question, which is the vote before special town meeting on February 4th is is whether or not to build a school. It's not how to fund it. I think that's mostly correct. I think that's an accurate statement. I think that the, the default for the town is a 30-year funding option. But the town meeting doesn't vote on <coughs> that. Option. They vote on the project that's been presented with the knowledge that we can pay for it through the budget. The reason I ask is that um, because of the timing you just mentioned as to when, if there was going to be a, a vote for a um, debt exclusion, when it has to occur, my concern is if, if town meeting votes yes to approve this project and then subsequently, <coughs> not too far subsequent, but subsequently there's the question about <coughs> the debt exclusion, if that fails, it wouldn't, I, I'm just concerned I don't want that to throw off the project, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There'd be no, that, in that scenario, there would be no impact on the project timeline. Uh, I had a couple of sp specific questions. It looked on one of the slides, maybe it was around 10 or something, that the time frame, the anticipated time frame for destruction of the current building is 
looked to me like it was just about the same time as the um, anticipated occupation of the new school. And it seems to me that coming into the school, you have to um, pass the old school. So I just wondered how, <coughs> physically, how that part was going to work. So, so we have a number of different road patterns that Joe and, and Charlie are working with the contractor on. And we're probably going to be creating special lanes for the, for the construction traffic to work on. They may be going the wrong way in to build the school so that the school traffic can come out. When we go to demolish the existing building, if the school's in session, <laughs> we'll probably, we could reverse that. And we'd make a special lane on the east side of the project where the construction demo trucks would go in and out. That's mm -hmm. the thinking right now. <clears throat> and to kind of add to that, I think what you're looking at is in the right side of the schedule here, um, moving into the school by July 21. So the school would be ready in June. We'll have our final punch list activities in that June. The school gets out, we move everything over that's going to stay into the new school. The demolition begins right away, still July at that point. Um, abatement, and then demolition, excuse me. Um, and then there's site work that will be occurring as the school year begins, but the demolition portion is complete. Could get done that summer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's tight, but it could. So kind of to echo what David said, having the CMR on board now is great because they can say if we do this and this we can put ourselves in a position to guarantee that we're ready for that July demolition. And it can sync them all up a little more easily with everybody in the um, in the process earlier. Exactly. Correct. Less yep. of a kind of I think I used the phrase forced marriage. Right. Yes I noticed that phrase. <laughs> um, th those are my major questions. Thank you very much for a very thorough presentation. Paul? Yes. I'm on the com I'm on the committee. Uh, I've heard the presentation I think about six times, and um, there are a lot of questions that I think are important. Aside from how the school project is going to ultimately be def um, worked out, but I think it's after the last week's selectmen's meeting, I think it's become very clear that what Steve just said, we're going to be voting, or the town meeting will be voting on moving this project forward, not how we're going to ultimately pay for it. I think that's become very clear tonight. We are going to pay for the project by either having, I believe, a 30-year bond issue or if the town and the selectmen want to try to get into that exclusion go that way but it ultimately if the debt exclusion were to fail we're still going to pay for the project the way we paid for other projects with a 30-year debt so I don't think there should be fear in town meeting <laughs> to not pass this project. This is a good project. I feel it's a very good project. There are a lot of things you might want to be asking aside from how we're ultimately going to be paying for it. This is not a project that is out of whack by any stretch of the imagination. There, Mike, I think, did a great job in, in looking at frills. I mean, there, isn't, there aren't a lot. There's some nice looking glass and things like that, but, if, but to be honest with you, this is a project that's going to meet the needs of K through 5. And I think the concept is outstanding. I think the parking and the drop-off and the pickup is outstanding. And those are questions that the first meeting we had seemed like that's all they wanted to talk about. But I'll guarantee you this. I spent the better part of 10 years of my retirement dropping kids off at that Smith School. And I can tell you that diagram should be extended out to Summer Street when you're dropping kids off because you, all you need is one bus to go in there and put a spread of flashing lights on and they come right out. I guess it's a ranch. I'm not sure which one goes out to uh, the summer, but it's backed up all the way. This is much better. I think public safety, student safety, are the children going to be protected once they're in the building? What are the exits? What are, what are the, 
How can you get in and out of the building? Those are things that are, are important. The elevator. The design of the building to protect children and help children with disabilities is extremely important. Those are the things that you have to look at when you look at this project. And believe me, there are not a lot of frills. There's nothing wrong with having a nice gymnasium and a nice cafeteria that has a staging in between where you can have all kinds of events. And you can have events in, in the arts, the music, <clears throat> right in the hallway. Instead of having to take the physical education teacher and get him to get out of his, build, his room every time you have an event, which you have to do right now at the Smith School. So we're just looking to present a facility that meets the needs for the future. And I want to ask a question, and maybe uh, I'm off on this one. The present enrollment, I think that school was built for 280 students. What are we in now? What are, what's our capacity now? What are we at? Are we at 280 or are we higher? We're, we're at 280 or 290. I would say it was built for a capacity slightly larger than that and that we've purposely, due to the open concept, kept students mm -hmm. away from the school right. in recent years. But we need space. And I guess the next question I have is how tight are we in the other four elementaries regarding pupil population in terms of number of students in, you don't have to give me the exact numbers in each building, but are we fairly close, tight, and at, at this point? Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Who is the gentleman at the microphone? Oh. <laughs> Add your mind. Keith Tavern, Assistant Superintendent with the schools. Um, we are at capacity in all of our other schools. We are beyond capacity in, in many instances and struggling to find space, um, space for special education, space for arts, right. and, and so this The point I'm trying to make then that. is that we need the school at this size. We well, originally came in trying to figure out how we could put another postage stamp on a smaller postage stamp. The state wouldn't go with it. So we're doing what we have to do according to what the state mandates. And I personally have you probably can tell I'm in, in favor of the project. But I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, I, as I've gone through most of the stuff, I, I've consistently gone back to basically the two phrases, necessity and appropriateness. And so the, the first question is, is this particular school necessary? And then the second question is, um, is what we've planned for that necessity appropriate? And I, and I agree with Paul, quite frankly, I may have many, many opinions about how we should fund this, but it's not our purview. It's not the purview of the Finance Committee, and frankly, it's not even the purview at this particular point of the, of the uh, town meeting. Ultimately, it's gonna be a decision made by the, by the selectmen, and then if they make a certain decision, it's a decision that's gonna be made by all of us as citizens. But what we're here tonight to, to talk about, I think, again, is that necessity of the school and the appropriateness of this plan. So in terms of the necessity, I think most of my questions in that regard have been answered. Clearly, we have an expansion of enrollment, uh, which may not be to the extent that the UMass uh, uh, people have, have said, but certainly if, if the past is any indication, it will be because they've been right on for the most part. The one question that I have for that is, this particular school, when it ultimately gets built, is going to be roughly about 20 or 25 percent bigger than our other elementary schools in some cases. Um, from an educational standpoint, is that acceptable to, to the educators in the room? And did we look at the possibility of spreading that increase out? Because ultimately what it looks like is, is that the, this particular school is going to accept a significant portion of our increase in enrollment in the elementary school level. Um, and was there a way or did we look at the possibility of spreading that out amongst the other schools? So we did explore many of those options. We discussed that with MSBA and um, we actually <laughs> looked at part of this project where we could look at potential additions to other schools in the future because there's a possibility beyond those 10 years that the population continues to grow. Um, educationally, we do think it is sound to have all of the students at the Highland School right now, we have three at each grade level, three classrooms. 
this will afford each grade level, um, something that we think we can do well to have that. We actually have also seen the population growth naturally happen at the Smith School. So over the course of the last two years, we've added a kindergarten classrooms. So we had three kindergartens at Smith last year. We'll have three we're anticipating for the upcoming year, as well as then three first grade classrooms. So much of that growth is happening naturally um, within the Smith District. And then we started to look at, as we mentioned earlier, the flex zones, but where that other population is. And um, in conjunction with Tepe, they've been able to build us a great GIS mapping tool that helps us project where the population growth will be in town so that we can look at that to establish these flex zones. So not only have the ability for the Smith School, but then if in five years that population growth is in the Thorpe District, that we can establish some of these zones to know what our population looks like and from where for the future. Great. Um, and then the other question I had was just, so I'm looking at the, the per square foot cost with it. Um, and we have a, a relatively large percentage from a contingency standpoint. Is the potential there that if the contingency mount, amount goes down, that that in, in turn also puts down our cost per square foot and so that our actual reimbursement rate would increase? So what the, once later on, if the price goes down, we're going to establish a funding agreement with MSBA at the beginning. And then if construction costs go, net, go down, their percentage stays the same. So their reimbursement might go down also. Okay. So we'll have to watch that. So if eligible costs go down, it stays the same split of what MSBA reimburses us for, that same percentage. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that, I, think, I think it's an excellent presentation. And again, and again, I think as I look at this, I don't think there's any question that we, that, that for any number of reasons, not the least of which is, what, what amazed me, quite frankly, out of everything that I just saw in this entire presentation, was that this school won some type of an award back in <laughs> 1973 for design. I mean, it's remarkable to me from that standpoint. But, you know, we made a lot of mistakes back in the early 70s. Okay. Um, and, uh, we're paying for them still in terms of these school buildings, and and this is another example of a necessary one where we've got to we've got to replace a school that frankly should have been built in a different way and a different design and a whole bunch of different things. So, like we had, it's a one Joe and I, 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 the second half I didn't say was, if we are able to cut costs that are in our hundred percent bucket, you know, the over three thirty three and the things that are over what they'll reimburse, now that's taking down our share. Okay. That's what. That's what. Yeah. That's, that's what I figured. That's we got to work yeah. on that to save yeah. the most money right there. So one of the MSBA cost caps is um, they won't reimburse over one percent for construction contingency, whereas industry standard is at least three percent or higher, depending right. if you're at Reno or new construction. So if the money that isn't sent isn't spent, excuse me, would have been spent on construction contingency, then that's a hundred percent savings from the town because the okay. MSBA wasn't going to participate in it. That makes sense. But Good. if you were going to spend eligible dollars that you're no longer spending, you don't get that reimbursement from MSBA. Yeah, so if we so cut, it depends where the cuts are. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So if we cut something that they had approved and that they want in the plan as part of their requirements, and they're not going to pay you for it, for right. that cut, is yeah. Right. I think, and I think that's Most been the likely, same I mean, with the other uh, schools. Argue for it. We, could, we, we always argue for it. Yeah. And we always say, you know, we did this instead. They're an interesting partner. <laughs> the. Um, but again, I, so I, I don't think there's any question that this is, necess is necessary. I think that based on the information that we've got, the plan that's been put before us is appropriate. Um, uh, there'll always be people who think that we pay too much for stuff, and I appreciate that. It's been that way for a long time. And quite frankly, maybe that's why we're in the trouble that we're in from the early 70s, that people said that and we went along with them. But um, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of this particular plan, and, and I think that it's something that we should support. Thanks, Mike. John? Um, all my questions were answered, so um, I think it's going to be great. Okay. Um, I apologize earlier. I didn't introduce our newest member. Uh, Sally Kearns was appointed uh, last week by the town moderator, so welcome. Uh, Thank you. And uh, with that introduction, please jump in. Thank you. Um, terrific presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Um, it's so interesting to listen to this um, presentation. I feel privileged to be on this committee to have a chance to ask some questions. Um, and I'm looking over at 
my friend Eric Crane, and I think there might be a few others of us. Diane, maybe, did you endure the portable classroom deal at the Holton <laughs> Richmond when we were in uh, little portable classrooms, which are now Arthur Skarmis's law offices. So there you go. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit, um, um, I think it's Charlie from Tepe. Yes. Um, you mentioned um, some flexible design in the, in the third or fifth grade classrooms or that, you, that they're academies and they are designed for specific grades. And I bring that up in connection with um, the concern I have around distribution of over-enrollment. And it seems to me that there's been a conscious decision to deal with overcrowding by building a lot of extra capacity in one building rather than, for example, deciding that we will plan for gradual um, add-ons at, at various other schools. So I, if you could talk a little bit about um, the flexible uh, zoning, and that might be more of a, that might not be in your bailiwick, but maybe I'll take, I'll take I'll yeah. take a shot at yes. that, and then if you could talk about can, whether those designs. I think this may be the, the question of how to approach this may, is more of a district policy in terms of. But I will say that most of your um, elementary school sites um, are not conducive to additions. In other words, going around and doing f five, adi four additions at four schools would be very difficult. I think. Uh, also, in terms of the MSBA process, they're not going to fund those projects. Those you would be doing on your own. So, uh, if you if you notice when we looked at the original timeline, our first submission went to MSBA in 2011 for a school to open in 2021. So, based on the 10-year enrollment projection that they provided us as part of this process, the 465 will we will fill that space within a 10-year span. So, if we went back to MSBA even today and said okay, or, or if we had done this last year and said, we want to instead add on to another school and we started a similar 10-year trajectory, we would have been way over capacity. Our capacity in the schools would not have been enough to handle all of our students if we had looked at it from that manner. So they, we've actually looked at the numbers and said, when we get to that 10-year, if it is the peak, we don't know what beyond that looks like, 465 actually will not be enough and then we'll go back to putting more pressure on our other elementary schools as well, if you look at it just from a numeric standpoint. So, for example, uh, when we did the renovations at um, Highlands, Great Oak, and Riverside, I, I do recall pretty vividly um, being, uh, it, it was pretty well clear that we hadn't planned big enough, that already they were, we were full. Um, and I, that was a meeting of, I think a very early meeting of, of DEEP. Uh, when that came to light. So my question, I guess, is this. Um, so now the plan will be a much, much bigger, double the size. <coughs> Smith School is going to be twice the size that it is now. I find it almost foreboding, but I, I get it. It's A lot of people have worked hard on this, and I, I'm not doubting their brains or their uh, know-how or their intentions. Okay, so we have this very large school. Now, we will be redistricting fairly regularly, right? Because in order to fill, so the hope you is have overcrowding at Highlands, which I know that you do because we've had it forever. I assume we'll be moving some kids to the Smith, maybe some from, and you'll have kind of this rotating shifting of students to fill the 465 place spots at, at Smith, right? Yes, we will have, we're, we're looking to establish flex zones, what we're calling them. So if you live at a given address, it would be that you attend one of two elementary schools and looking to establish those zones in multiple areas of the town where we know the population will be growing in the next five to seven years that way we can have that flexibility to 
um, fill the schools, but I, I don't want to think of it as it's just going to keep being this rotating towards Smith. There will be a bubble of students that, yes, will move from a section of town and, and attend the Smith School from kindergarten and then progress as they get to fifth grade. So our goal is to not have to move any existing student from second grade at Highlands and say now you're going to third grade at Smith. The goal is that we can have those children start their careers at the Smith School and then continue at the Smith School for their elementary career. And that if you are a sibling, a family with a sibling that's already at the Highland School in third grade and you're a kindergartner coming in, that no, you have the ability to stay at the Highland School and, and go to the school where your family is, that we're not splitting families and getting into some of those dynamics, that by have it be a more fluid process than a rigid, traditional um, redistricting process. Uh, okay, thank you. Gina? Uh, a lot of my questions have been answered. I did attend a, a planning workshop for the um, Damage Public Schools last, was it last fall, and it was a wonderful experience. There was a great monitor, moderator that talked about um, how 21st century learning has really changed and how our buildings don't fit that model anymore, and it's really exciting to see a model that um, includes some of those ideas. Closed rooms, but lots of windows, um, common spaces, so um, thank you. And I know some families in this district that are very unhappy with the current <coughs> school. I went to an open middle school and it was a miserable experience. Um, mm -hmm. And they've now since closed up all the walls. It's very distracting. Um, and I know Smith has a lot of um, age-related issues. So it's a no-brainer that we need this school and obviously some of the other schools are full and we, we definitely need the extra capacity that side of town is growing. And, and that side of town is also kind of segregated from the rest of town. I'm on the other side. So unfortunately, my children won't benefit. But uh, I do have a question about the playground. Is the existing playground being torn down, and is a new playground included in this plan? So the the uh, the existing playground is going to be disrupted by construction. So it will be relocated during the two years of construction. The existing one will be at the uh, completion of construction. However, there will be brand new playgrounds there. Um, as part of the project. That's included in the cost? It is. Okay. So the, the costs are, are soup to nuts. So the costs are including, you know, your, they have all the project costs, so all the soft costs are in there, uh, but also all the anticipated construction costs, furnishing, everything is in there, uh, and that includes site work and okay. site, and site uh, amenities. Great. Um, and on the financing side, I know we're not deciding that tonight, but at what point does the MSBA grant sort of lock into its amount, and what happens if our costs eventually exceed the $52 million? Do we have to borrow more? So, uh, the, the MSBA grant is locked in now. That was okay. the, the key milestone was in December of 2018. So once they approve uh, the, the PSR, the preferred no, project scope and budget agreement. Yes, which is part of, is it the PTSD, the PO? Yeah. yeah, thank you. So we have the PSB now, and then it becomes the PFA. Becomes. So the, 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 and the key, I think, earlier we talked about um, the seven cost estimates and the, and the healthy contingency is to ensure that we don't have to come back to town meeting and ask for additional funds because, A, the MSB won't participate beyond what's approved at the, at the December 2018 point, and, B, we don't ever want to go back to town meeting and ask for additional funds to complete projects. So, um, you know, nothing is 100% certain in this world, but this we think is a pretty conservative point to be starting from. Historically on our school projects, we end up um, uh, not authorizing the full debt amount. We end up rescinding, I think it was roughly $10 million on the, on the high school project uh, was authorized debt that was rescinded. Um, I, I've, I, I'm, you know, I've only been here four years, but my, my read of this community is it, it's not a community that once the uh, Contingency is preserved. Uh, the the town starts spending that contingency on all the things that they would have liked to have had. Um, I've seen communities like that, but certainly in, in reviewing the project budgets from past projects in Danvers, um, town meeting approves a number, and uh, uh, future town meetings uh, enjoy rescinding that debt when it isn't needed. So, we hope this is a conservative number at this point, and the MSBA certainly wants that as well. And I I just want to clarify because I thought I heard a couple different things you said. If we don't spend the full 52 million and all the contingencies, that the grant would be reduced and the debt would be reduced. So the the 20 the 20.5 million dollar grant is 
it, it assumes that we spend the full 31.5. So if, if we spend less, the MSBA spends less. So okay. the grant would, in, would de it would never increase, but it would decrease in proportion with our percent, our, our percent as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just wanna thank you for bringing up the educational visioning. Um, it's such an important part, both for taking part in it and bringing it up, but it's such an important part of this design especially in terms of MSBA. I mentioned we have an eight part process with them with multiple submittals in each. And right from then, which was right at the very beginning, you hire an OPM, you hire an architect, and educational visioning begins. And they really hold us to the findings of that. Um, Dr. Frank Locker is great. Um, so thanks again for bringing it up. It's a really important part of this. It's my pleasure. I wish everybody could experience that because things have, I mean, I'm. I have small children, but I'm surprised how much has changed in the last 20 to 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Keith, uh, do we cap our student population in a classroom? Do we, is there a number that we try to, so, we talk about classrooms, is there a number that we try to keep in there? So we try to have class sizes between 18 and 22 is the target size. Mm -hmm. Contractually, it's capped at 27 for grades one through five. 25, then we can do an overage up to 27 or 22 in kindergarten. Okay. And just curious, how often are we exceeding the 22 or 25? You know, um, or what percentage of classrooms are over? We probably have a handful a year, so three or four classrooms a year maybe, and, and part of that is due to <laughs> space constraints, is sure. we don't have additional room to open additional classrooms at yeah. the moment, even if we wanted to. Okay. Um, and another question I, I was thinking about as uh, uh, reading through uh, the presentation, uh, which was excellent, by the way, thank you, was uh, talking about that we started doing the elementary school renovations back in the early 90s. Uh, by the time this project ends, uh, the early 90s is a long time ago. Uh, where are we um, in terms of looking forward to renovations and expansions or new buildings? Uh, you know, realistically, how do uh, comparatively, because I think there are some people out there that are saying, not in my backyard, but I think if we've got a building like this, there'll be pe and people are going to our other schools, they'll be saying, why isn't that in my backyard? Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, and Dave, you might have a handle on this as well, the condition of our other schools and the, uh, of them moving forward um, as we're about to spend a lot of money on this one. So part of the MSBA guidelines for these guys is to build 50-year schools, so that the building, the structure, the wind, that'll all last 50 years. We have components of the buildings that will only last less. Sure. The shuts is the roofs, the 25-year roofs, the heating systems are about 25 years, the heating control systems. So through our normal capital planning, we'll keep up with that stuff to make sure we work to get 50 years out of those elementary schools. Second to that is part of the, uh, what happens inside the school with the educational program. And that's where we work with the school each year to make changes inside those buildings so that we change the libraries, change the art room. Each year we look at the priorities with them. So we're changing the inside of the schools all the time. And they're all good, sturdy, well-built schools. And we can change the insides. It's not like we've got the Dunwing again. And that's what we just worked Or the to, Smith School. Or the Smith School, <laughs> right. That our hands are just tied with those buildings. But we're good. They're good brick and mortar buildings. That we can ch do changes on the inside to meet Great. the educational program. Terrific. And so far, so good in the next. No, right. And thank you to David. I mean, they do a, an incredible job maintaining the buildings. I think MSBA said that to us when they gave us the extra points for maintenance. Um, and like David said, we're all on the same team of making those changes year in and year out. And I think that's the exciting part about the Smith School is that as that does open up some capacity in other schools, this will allow us to put maker space, STEM, STEAM spaces into all five elementary schools. So to really get back to the equity and making sure that we have an equal educational experience for all of our K to five students by having this project completed for the Smith School. Great. Okay. And Steve, I think we've picked up a few more acronyms for the index. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Are there questions from the audience tonight? Mr. Toomey? To the, yeah, please. John Toomey, uh, Franklin Street. Uh, I'm a little confused. Um, you have a warrant article. To see if the town will vote to appropriate, borrow, or transfer from available funds 
amount of money to be expanded for the building of the school and so forth. When I was in town meeting, I can't remember ever doing anything without having a cost associated with it, tied with it, even if it was an estimated cost. It, um, I understand that you're talking various methods of funding this and uh, what's bothering me is if I'm going to buy an item I don't take the item sign ownership and then discuss money when we went to town meeting and we were going to do something build something construct something we always had a cost even if it was an estimated cost in the warrant so that we more or less had a limit as to what was going on. Uh, can anybody, A, I would like to see a figure in the, on the warrant, in the warrant. Uh, could anybody explain why yes or why no? Sure. Mr. Bartha? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, John, I'd refer, uh, if you take a look at Article 1, the State Public Works Grant, uh, nowhere in the article itself is the figure reflected, but if you look at the explanation, we have $181,200 or $28. And similarly, um, if you flip uh, deeper into the warrant, you'll see that $52 million is the figure that will be presented. Um, if, if the Finance Committee votes to move this forward, then what goes to town meeting is the specific area. That's consistent well, with well, past practice. Okay, but what I'm getting at is when you go to town meeting and they read the warrant article, they're going to say what's here, right? No. Okay, what are they So gonna... you, what you're looking at tonight, sir, is the explanation portion of the warrant that always goes to the town meeting. What you'll receive after tonight's meeting, if the, if the Finance warrant. Committee votes that way, is, are the actual motions for town meeting, which so will include the actual dollar figures. In the article, there's going to be a dollar figure. Correct. $52 okay. million dollars will be the figure that appears in the Warren article. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Town Manager, if I might suggest, in the at the workshop, perhaps having uh, sample language from previous town meetings with the, uh, the high school uh, Highland School and the middle school where similar projects took place, uh, showing that language both in the, uh, uh, the warrant and explanation report and the, and the warrant would be very helpful uh, at that meeting. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Rick Bettencourt, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 5. Um, you know, my, my daughter's beyond elementary at this point, and, but I think this is an incredible project for the, for the town of Danvers. And some of the constituencies in my area are elderly on fixed incomes, um, so there's some concern. And I, you know, being FinCom, I figure we talk about the, the, the cost of it, and I, I think it's important to identify that although in a graph we, we look at average increase of, of possible tax bills of one, was it 155 to 179, I believe it was? That's truly not the average increase in the property tax bill over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, our, our school budget has increased $10 million. That's 42% of our budget, but it's increased $10 million since 2016. So the actual average tax increase is going to be substantially more than the 175 or one whatever it might be. So I think it's important that that discussion is going to, to, to Mr. Toomey's point, that's an important piece to bring up to the, to the, to the people, to the town meeting at, at next month when we sit down and meet. The, um, the cost is real, and I've read someplace, is there any plans to assist some of the seniors on fixed incomes from a tax input, from a tax impact standpoint, Steve? Is it, what's, what's the idea? Because obviously their kids aren't in school, they don't need it, they should, in my opinion, should have some sort of relief from it. Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, when the when the selectmen began discussing this in December, one of the first questions Selectman Bennett asked was, um, if if we decide to put a question like this forward, can we also be looking at uh, the elderly tax exemption and the tax work off? And the answer is yes. And I, if if uh, and I know that the board is already thinking about um, taking something like that. That would go to annual town meeting. So those would be those would be by, those okay. would be changes that the town meeting would vote on in May. Um, number two, I mean, as far as the I, as far as the, I know, we're not I. 
talking about the manner in which we're going to fund the project right now. But as, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I would probably lean towards, as a, on the record, suggestion trying to save the town another $14 million over the next so many years. I would be in favor of a 20-year bond payment plan for that particular project. Um, the other uh, piece I just wanted to talk to about the design of the school itself is I noticed the location of the gymnasium and the, and the gym towards the front of the school by the main entrance and the, the, the location of the students and what's towards the back. And in today's day and age, being what it is, what is the security protocols that have been put in place for the school, both at the entrance, side entrances on, on, in towards <coughs> the rear? Uh, in my opinion, I... I think some of the schools in Danvers security protocol could be enhanced a little bit. Uh, so I'd like to see that or hear what, what the plan is for security uh, for our kids. Um, so the, there is a, um, there already has been meetings with first responders in Danvers. There is a, a security consultant who's on the design team actually uh, worked on Sandy Hook. So they're a very sophisticated firm. They've done a lot of this kind of work. And secure, so there will be active and passive security measures within the building. The school, the district obviously has its own set of uh, mm -hmm. security protocols, which we are generally um, folding into the design. But this building will be, um, will pretty much be relatively state of the art in terms of security protocol, in terms of both active and passive design measures. If I can just add, so yeah. we're obviously not going to dive too much into what oh, our no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. are, but we've looked at everything from how do we secure students should something happen sure. in parts of the building to the level of detail of which way do doors open and how do those enhance or hurt our safety protocols yeah. into that level of detail. Just so as someone that's got a 14-year-old daughter and I, I, you know, it's, it's seeing the situations, I know there's been times I've come into school and just walked in and it's good to go. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of the good guys, but that's just not how it is all the time and wherever you go. So, uh, I mean, for me, security is is very important. And just for whatever reason, if costs start to go up a little bit, I just ask that you don't skimp on the security systems. Just keep those in place. Thank you. Mr. Duggan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Matthew Duggan, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 1. Uh, we'd like to just uh, talk briefly about how this project contributes to our overall debt load. Uh, over the past you know, 10, 15 years, we've done a number of uh, big ticket projects, middle school, high school, uh, the police station, among others. And, and I'm, I'm wondering how much this is going to handicap us. Uh, the town manager mentioned we won't be able to do small projects like uh, upgrading uh, Sandy Beach or LaBelle's Grove. So is this like a short-term scenario where we're kind of restricted on what big projects we can do down the road uh, for maybe, what, 10 years, five years? Just trying to understand. It seems like we're at a point where we can afford to finance a th for 30 years, but we can't do 20. So it's, it, I don't know if it's because we don't have enough free cash or what other limitation we're experiencing that requires us to, you know, 30 years, that runs out to like $60 million for, you know, many of us won't be here 30 years from now. Does that handicap people that come after us to, to fill these roles? Um, I can take a crack at answering that, Matt. The, it's kind um, of complicated, is it? If, if you flip to page 12 in your warrant, this is a, this is a grossly over oversimplified image, but I think it helps kind of tell the story. Um, traditionally, towns and cities uh, sell debt uh, in a way that we don't as homeowners. So generally, when you take out a mortgage from the bank, it's a, it's my, my mortgage payment is the same every single month until I either move or, or pay off my house. Towns and cities like to front load their debt, and that we talk about the curve all the time in our debt load. So if, if you look at page 12, the light blue is the 20 year financing model. And what you see is a peak in the early years and a, and a rapid decline in the out years. Um, when we did the high school project in 2013, we, we level funded that over 30 years. So in our debt table, which, we'll, which we have a much more complicated version of this during the budget process, uh, it's a fixed number that goes out to the, to the end of the, end of the debt. So you, you end up achieving a slightly lower debt payment in years one through 15, but you're locking in blocks in your debt service in the out years. 
if we did no projects this year, so if we weren't doing Smith School and we had no other projects in front of us, we would see about a quarter million dollar natural decline in our debt service line. And that's because prior town meetings and boards had layered in debt for typical things like the library HVAC system, uh, aerial ladder truck, the dispatch <laughs> center, those are all on a, on a rapidly declining format. And, and, and that's by design so that as that debt falls off, you can put new debt in. So the, the short answer is, um, if with the 30 year funding model, you'll be stacking the Smith School on top of the high school, that will absolutely have an impact on town meetings in 2030, 2035, and 2040 in terms of what flexibility they have to make decisions about projects, whether it be the, the public works facility that um, showed up at the end of the capital plan when I got here uh, in 2014. So I know for a long time the town has talked about the need for a new DPW facility. Um, we don't have a lot of capacity, and that's, you know, we've, we've operated at our levy limit for quite some time, um, and that through fiscal conservatism that has worked. Uh, but we are running out of, you know, there are tools you can only use once or twice. And level funding projects like this, that works in the short term, but to your point, in the long term, you end up uh, eating up a lot of your, your capacity in the out years. Right. So the, the debt exclusion, what that would do in the short term, it would, it would take pressure off of the operating budget in terms of poor service provision, and it would offer flexibility to future town meetings in terms of capital projects that they may want to approve. Well, that's, that's one of the concerns I had is uh, future revenue. So we have these other uh, pressures in the budget from unfunded liabilities for uh, health insurance and retirement. So um, it, it's not easy to forecast those. So down the road, we may find ourselves with exclusions and with overrides uh, out of necessity. And, um, you know, from, from this vantage point that we have now, we're... I think we're trying to be optimistic about how we handle those. Um, just one other thing about a comment I heard that town meeting shouldn't be uh, concerned about funding or doesn't have input on funding. You know, this requires two-thirds uh, vote at town meeting, and I'm not saying that anyone would would be against this project, but just to keep in mind that um, town meeting does have the final say about this. And, uh, I, don't, I didn't understand why, why someone felt the need to say that. But town meeting represents the residents. And uh, I'm sure you'll find uh, some residents who don't think that this is uh, um, something that we should be um, funding. But again, I think it's a good project. I've been to a number of these forums. They've been always uh, um, well attended and, uh, and the material was uh, presented uh, in an easy to understand format. So I want to thank you for that. Thanks. Quick follow-up question. Is the debt, does, are towns allowed to refinance their debt down the road if the interest rates decrease or? Yeah, we, uh, we did that a couple years ago. Um, and I think uh, Joe Collins uh, and, and Rodney would be working in hand-in-hand in -hand with Hilltop. We review our existing debt every year to see if there's an opportunity. Um, on a lot of projects like the high school, which we just did, there's a 10-year window where you're not allowed to refi. Um, and on that project, that's a project in particular where we locked that project in at, at a historically low interest period. So there, there, we probably, that's a project we may never refinance. <laughs> but two years prior to that, we refinanced a number of projects, and I think we saved roughly $600,000 over the life of those bonds by doing that. So every year we take a look at, at existing debt. Since we're on that top, yeah, sure. Just Ted, when you get down there, introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, my name is Ted Blake. I'm a town meeting member of Precinct 8. Um, since we're on that topic, are, um, on, what, are both of the bond, the potential finance, financing options callable or refinanceable before their maturity? I know you said that you did. So is the 30-year bond is the 30-year option refinanceable? In the, in That's a determination we'd make closer to the time of issuance. But I think we we generally wouldn't want to lock ourselves beyond the 10 years we did on the high school. Okay. I mean, you, you, you bet, I mean, you, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably uh, in the field. Yeah, I'm going to ask some dorky questions. Yeah, here. but we get a little, so you know that we get a little better <laughs> rate by agreeing to that 10-year callback. Yep. We get a little better rate up front. We would yep. never want to be locked from doing it for the life of the bond. And and similar on the on the 20-year. I mean, my pre and what are the nominal interest rates like? Ballpark, like that people are quoting you on the on the two so options right now. So we I think um, 
<coughs> when, when this material was prepared, we were looking at, I think, 4% on the 20 and 4.5% on the 30, knowing that, that there, there's going to be some slip one way or the other. So, like, my perception, I, I watched the um, Board of Selectmen meeting the other night, too. Um, you know, I stare at interest rates all day long. I, I certainly don't think the 30-year the option is egregious by any stretch from an interest rate standpoint. And it seems like people are getting wrapped around the axle with the extra interest costs. And, you know, we're talking about $15 million over 30 years. If you, if you put a present value, you know, people are looking at that apples to apples to the, the literal sticker costs of what we're paying out to contractors right now. I think um, we could help eliminate confusion if we at least present to people, like, what, what that, is, that savings is in present value terms. Because really what this, to me, what it comes down to is it's, it's a simple question of just like your house, are you going to finance it with a 15-year or, or a 30-year? And it's, it's, it doesn't strike me as reckless or stressing the, the town in any way I mean, to be if we can't get a, an override pass for the 20-year to end up with a 30-year. Um, so that's just you know, my, my thought. It, what, it, it wasn't very clear to me you know, which way that... Um, what, what the options were, if, if, if you could just present a present value, I think it would be very helpful to people to understand really the dollars that we're talking about. And it seems like people were getting focused on it at the Board of Selectmen meeting when I really think we should be talking about the merits of the, the project and the costs involved in the project and all that. Um, is it okay if I ask a couple other questions that aren't related to the financing? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, one of the questions I had um, after watching the meeting, we talked, um, you mentioned if we did smaller, more modest, you know, a smaller Smith school and then plan to do um, upgrades to the other elementary schools to accommodate growth down the road, it would, you know, basically be some redundant professional planning. A lot of um, professional fees would be involved in that. What's the extra busing cost, though, is, that would be entailed by, you know, consolidating a greater pe portion of our elementary school population at one, at one location? So uh, we don't anticipate anything beyond maybe one or two extra buses. We plan to utilize the existing routes and just reroute those buses that all have capacity on them. As of this moment, we'll look at the ratio of drop-offs for bus riders, et cetera, that okay. we'll look at on a yearly basis. Um, and I apologize for being late. I, I had a meeting in Boston. If, if any of this is redundant, just tell me to watch, watch the video. Um, <laughs> I have no problem with that. Um, the, the discussion of the contingencies and where we talked about if, if we didn't utilize all the contingencies, we wouldn't necessarily get all the, you know, the, uh, as much state funding. Um, I sort of understand where you're going with it, but if we were getting capped out at $330 or whatever the per square foot is with the MSBA, it would seem to me that we would, if we save $5 million on construction costs that are eligible for MSBA consideration, that should all flow to us, shouldn't it? Um, no, because the... MSBA grant, if you can go to the next slide, <coughs> thank you. The 20.488 uh, there in the darker orange on the left table, towards the bottom, just like the bottom, that is, um, it assumes a certain amount of eligible costs being spent. So if you don't spend the money on the eligible costs, you won't get that maximum rainbow. But, so, but like, so let's just say, like, it's, you're literally building one thing. And it's 500 bucks a square foot, and they only cover reimburse up to 375, 335, yeah, sure. and you come in at 375. Haven't you spent 100 percent of what would be eligible by their definition? You see what I'm saying? If 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 they're rendering the, the last five million dollars of this project ineligible because it's over the costs, sure. the, what their definition of of yeah. reimbursable costs are and we come back and save $5 million, why should their reimbursement rate, total, total nominal reimbursement rate go down? So it completely depends on where those savings are. Right. So there's a number there, the $700,000 figure of construction contingency. Yep. For every single dollar that's saved, that is the one-to-one -one savings for Danvers because MSBA wasn't going right. to reimburse right. it anyways. If you end up, if TAP A generously says, we're going to knock $50,000 off of our fee. And MSBA already agreed to a certain fee from the designer. The MSBA right. would then say, those are costs you're not incurring that we agreed to paying for. So we're not going to pay you for them. So, Does that, that make sense? 
I'm gonna I'm probably gonna make this more complicated instead of less complicated. <laughs> Look at the top numbers. So for example, if if we were if this 52 became 50, the first thing that would happen is that this number would reduce because this is 56 percent of this, mm -hmm. and I think that that change would flow down through. So you'd see both the grant and the town share would 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 reduce. I understand um, the point you're making, Ted, but I. I, I my read of this is that that savings would start at the top and trickle all the way through these numbers to the bottom. Okay. I think I, I, I think I get it now. Can um, I, can I, because I, this was my question initially, and I think yeah. part of the problem is we look at it from a simple standpoint of saying the building is 86,000 yeah. square feet. It costs us $56 million. You do the div simple division. That gives us a cost per square foot. I don't think that the SBA uses such a simple calculation in terms of their determination of it, square footage. It actually continues throughout the whole project. Every cost estimate we send, or every pay payment we send in to MSBA, we have to justify that what we did was eligible. So okay. that these guys will be working that through the whole budget to maximize what we get from MSBA. Um, I've only been here three years, so um, my knowledge of like past um, construction projects is is besides seeing them is quite low um, what was what was our track record with um, construction within contingencies on the high school and the, I guess on the middle school too well you know when the high school came in we rescinded ten million dollars in debt and of our our contingency we mm -hmm. returned 50 percent of the contingency back okay so it was, it was, was the final one yep okay, okay. Um, Um, the other question I had on the growth that the um, UMass study provided us, I know they nailed it, um, the 05 to 15 projection within one. How much of that growth, population growth or student or enrollment growth came from the construction projects that weren't approved by the planning board, like Endicott Green? Yeah, so I mean, that, I think that's. Like I, I, I yeah. you know, are they accidentally accurate? I mean, it, no, are, I, mean I, think I, it, I know we we did the zoning thing last time yeah. to sort of be able to put ourselves in a position not to be exposed to that kind of growth that's not with in the. So we we go through this a lot. Sometimes with the DEP, um, we're trying to overstate our growth because we'll yep. say you're not giving us full credit for the zoning that we're about to do. Um, I, I think whether it's the MSBA, the uh, UMass, or the DP. They're assuming some static along the trend line. So they know that for every zoning issue in a town that fails, there's going to be an unanticipated 4 to be that passes. And um, some of it's probably dumb, dumb luck, but a lot of it, I think, is, is statistical analysis that I couldn't begin to understand. Okay. Um, uh, um, the home growth, the, I know you guys sort of laid out the estimated tax bill. Is, are you assuming any home growth or taxable real estate growth? In projecting out the average cost per per residence. No, the, so we took we're using current mill rate and yep. current um, market value. We we average about six hundred thousand dollars a year in growth um, over the long haul. Some years like it, it's conservative, which I, I'm always happy for. But if you're like trying to sell a project, like you know we're budgeting for a lot of growth, and we're assuming that nobody that, that we're not assuming that those new people come in and offlay any of the burden. Um, so I mean, like again, it's a conservative thing, but uh, which is always good. But I, I do think you, to people that are worried about their property taxes and fixed incomes, it pre perhaps presenting a, like, hey, if if our mil if you know if our taxable base grows as it has historically, this is what it looks like as well. Um, might help. And then lastly, we don't need to talk about it here, but just the sticker price and the, you know the construction costs. I'm sure it's going to come up if there's any way to kind of. Even anecdotally explain the why why there's been such a massive rise in construction costs. I mean, just since I moved here, yeah. it went up you know two hundred twenty five dollars or one hundred twenty five dollars, and the, you know since two thousand ten it's been pretty nuts. So I just think that would, that, give, that will help give people um, you know comfort that it's you know not some. I know. think you're absolutely right. I, we, we struggle with that, and I think the, the, kind of the the um, if we could if we could lock in recession era bid prices with our record high employment numbers, we would take that and run with it. So the, what we gained, you know, in, in, you know, during the recession is the last time the town of Danvers had to lay off employees. So at a time when we were laying off employees, we were also locking in incredible rates on our building projects. And the, the flip side now is that the economy is really good. 
but it's yeah. a lot more expensive to put a building up today than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. So, thanks, thanks. thanks. Mr. Bates. Thank you, Bill Bates, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 4. Um, first of all, congratulations, Mr. Chairman, um, and I hope that um, you as the new chairman, I really appreciated the 7 o'clock start time tonight. Uh, it did give us, uh, those of us that work out of town, a chance to get home, have dinner with our families, and then come to the FinCom. Um, I would kind of back off, though, if, if there was another night that you had a heavy agenda, maybe 6.30 would be okay, but please, none of those 6 o'clock meetings. They're very difficult to make. You're getting soft as you get older. I know. I'm it's sorry. I, you tell me I have to. <laughs> Sally Kearns, very excited to see you up there. This is wonderful. Um, John Sweeney, thank him for his service for so many years. That man was just a rock up there on the FinCom. I didn't know he retired, so I sent well, him the a best. Fun, a fun fact is that John Sweeney was appointed by David Mill's father to the FinCom. Oh, that is a fun fact. There you go. I wanted to just share, you know, we, we talked about how bad the Smith School was. Uh, sorry, I had two daughters that went to the Smith School. It was a fantastic school. Um, it was kept artificially low with, with the amount of students we had there because of the open walls. But then there was a lady named Sue Ambrosovich and another one like Mrs. Burrow, who were the principals, and they had to just teach a little bit extra respect to the kids because they didn't have walls. So the kids that went to Smith School didn't miss anything. They got a little bonus. So I don't, I don't want to see anything that we're, uh, you know, we're worried about what happened to the Smith School kids. Um, I did have a question on the 490 square foot, the 540 square foot. I'm just a layman. I, I figure that $6.2 million, if we reduce it, if we, if, let's say that square, uh, the cost came in at 490, that would put your square footage at 40.5 million versus 44.7 million if it came in at 540. And I would think that the MSBA, they realize that. They're not going to penalize you if you can get a better rate on the square footage. Because they're, gonna, they're only paying 333. That's their cap. Am I right? You're right. <laughs> Good. Let's have to move on. It's fine. We just, everything has to line up. There's a whole calculation. You guys we still want to yeah. promise that because these guys have to. A lot of calculations have. To, the MSB works hard to get every nickel they can they can get. So, but you're right in the logic. And, and that's what I want. The, the thing is, the 333 that they uh, fixed that right now is something that the MSBA has said. That's all we can afford. And I know some people say, oh, you know, what are they? It's all they can afford. And don't forget, our our in our percentage we get is based on our ability as a town to pay. The city of Lawrence gets 90% reimbursement on these projects. We're sitting here at 56, so you've got to weigh the whole thing. And I just wanted to make sure that I had it right that if we, if we were able to get a good bid and our square footage comes down, MSBA is going to still stay at where they're at, at the 333. And that's what the gentleman, Mr. Ted Blake, was saying. So I, I think we're going to be okay with that. Can we refi it afterwards? I think the town manager answered it, um, and the quote I put in was, prior to the issuance of the debt, Massachusetts general law would allow you to, to go for a better rate or change the funding mechanism. I, as a town meeting member, will be voting for the $52 million, however you come up with it, but you have to have a way, and you explain it, that there is a way to pay for it. So I think I understand that. Um, lastly, in another capacity, I had the privilege of being at the MSBA meeting with the town of Danvers earlier this, uh, last, late 2018. One of the proudest things was when Treasurer Goldberg and other members asked many of the people that are in this room tonight and myself, how does Danvers build such quality schools without debt exclusions. Would you please share it with us? This was a member of the MSBA. And I'm sitting there in my suit, and I'm just as proud as can. And the two superintendents answered their, their, present, their part of it. And then I mentioned it was my feeling that because of the stabilization funds we started many, many years ago, uh, town meeting members, 
uh, helped do that. That helped it. But what also makes Stanford so good is a representative town meeting. It's worth the money we spend. I've been an elected town meeting member in this town for about 22 years, and it's one of the proudest things I do. So great project. Um, I'm going to leave you with 30-year amortization. Some people in town, including I think myself, I'm not sure we can afford to do the 20 year. I can afford the 30 year, um, and I'd rather see it go that way. And don't forget, education is a gift from one generation to the other. Our elderly people, we have a lot of things in the assessing department that they can get some breaks on their taxes. But they also know that they're paying for the education that may help them. We're, this is a community. It's a great project. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Mr. Nicholson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill Nicholson, Precinct 8, town meeting member. Uh, last selectman's meeting, I think I left my memory at home. I've been a town meeting member almost 50 years. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's more. Uh, I made the statement that was incorrect. And the statement I made was come in with a 30-year plan don't ask for a debt exclusion because you're not going to get it. Well, I was wrong in a couple of places. One, I realized later that when we vote on something, there's always money attached. The town meeting is going to have $55 million on the Warren article that we're going to vote for. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I didn't do at the Suckman's meeting was I didn't say what a great project this is. I was on the school committee, I mean on the design construction committee for the middle school and the high school both. Uh, I put my name in for this, but I think I got lost in the shuffle. Uh, but third time out, okay? Uh, it is a good project. It's a project that's needed. When we used to have voting up there, we had to hold the signs way up at the end of the street. And there's this big dip going down, and you had to take a right and go into the gymnasium. And it was somewhat of a nightmare place, especially when the sun went down. Uh, so I hope the lighting mm -hmm. in the new project <laughs> is a lot better than what's there now. Yeah. <laughs> So as a town meeting member, I am certainly going to support this project at town meeting, and I hope my other fellow town meeting members do. I lost one of my voters to this committee. I now have two openings in Precinct 8. <laughs> <laughs> we have a caucus coming up, so anyone interested in Precinct 8, please get in touch with me. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good luck with your championship. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions from the audience? Any other questions from the committee? Can I, can I move the article? Second. Is it clear what we mean when we say we move the article that we're uh, approving or recommending the $52 million project? with the net project cost of the town estimated at 31.51. So I'm not yes. quite sure of the wording. But. That's correct. No, you're fine. Okay. Second. And there's a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?
Thank you. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.